welcome um, to Agribusiness Global Live. My name is Renee Targus, and I'm the editor for Agribusiness Global Direct. I'll be your host. Uh, today's webinar, Future Development of Crop Protection and Seed Markets, is presented by Alistair Phillips and Derek Oliphant, both our founding members of Ag Bio Investor. And um, just a little bit about our uh, speakers today. Both got their start at Phillips McDougall. Um, Alec Alistair specializes in seed and trade analysis, and he just recently joined Agribusiness Global's advisory board. Derek specializes in crop protection and is a key contributor to the AgBio crop report, which is a, a quantitative and qualitative analysis of the global crop protection market. So I wanna welcome them both. Um, we also just have a few housekeeping. Um, we are taking questions from attendees, but we will answer those questions after the pr presentation is over. Um, if we don't get to your question, what we'll do is take it and we will post it online. We'll create a blog for all answers to be um, answered by Alistair and Derek on agribusinessglobal.com. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alistair and Derek. That's great. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure uh, for me and Derek to be here to speak to you today. Um, I'm assuming that there will be a fair few of our existing clients at this uh, presentation. So um, hello to you. And for anybody else who's not familiar with Ag Bio Investor, we're analysts and consultants for the global crop protection and seed industries. And uh, what we do is uh, we supply multi-client reports on crop protection and seed, as well as data-driven databases uh, that look at uh, crop protection usage on the ground within the particular agricultural year. We also have databases on formulated and technical crop protection products um, traded before they actually come to, uh, to sale. We have uh, commodity tracking and forecasting databases as well as um, more in-depth um, GM seed analysis. So um, please feel free to visit our website at agbioinvestor.com where you're able to get access to our news service and also um, arrange any demos. But also uh, we have a free to use um, service um, housed at gm.agbioinvestor.com where um, we provide um, free to use GM seed information looking at utilization rates, product introductions, areas, and, um, and more regulatory um, based data. So just before we get start our presentation, I would like to say that any um, values that you see in here, dollar values, these are all measured at the X manufacturer level. So um, this is the first stage of uh, distribution coming from the manufacturer. This is not farm gate level data that we're describing. Also, all values are, will be displayed in nominal US dollar terms unless explicitly stated. When we're talking about our um, forecasted numbers, these are calculated on a real basis where we're excluding the impact of currency and inflation. So with that, my colleague Derek is gonna start the presentation and take you through the crop protection part. Thanks, Alistair. So yeah, we'll look at global crop protection market performance. Uh, what, what we'll focus on here is looking at what we think the situation will be as we move through to 2023. Um, 2022, of course, was a, a very uh, unusual year in the crop protection industry, in fact, in a lot of industries globally. Crop protection, uh, definitely the case. You can see this chart here. We're going back a couple of decades and just charting the development of the crop protection market over time. And we can see that the market has been steadily increasing over the last two decades with a few periods of peaks and troughs. Um, what you tend to see is in terms of uh, low commodity prices, or you can see in 2008, low glyphosate prices, uh, the market tends to weaken. Uh, also high inventories as well, which puts pressure on um, the, the pricing of products and how it's able to move through the, the sort of different channels. But for 2022, we had almost a perfect storm of different positive factors. So we had very high agrochemical pricing. A lot of it is holdovers coming from the effects of the pandemic and other energy supply issues. Uh, very strong commodity pricing as well. Um, this is obviously a benefit. We'll touch on that a bit more later, but strong commodity pricing tends to be a net positive for the crop protection industry. We also had favourable weather conditions in a lot of key markets, particularly in, in high-value markets such as Australia, 
also quite positive in the winter uh, in Europe and also the US as well. Less so as we move through the summer, um, but we'll touch on that in a bit more detail. Uh, so looking at 2023, it's important to see what happened in 2022 uh, as, as the first stage. So what we're looking at here is the market in 2022. As I mentioned, very, very positive. In nominal terms, the global crop protection market was up by over 12%, which is very strong rates of growth going by historical standards. Now, currency was a major uh, impact uh, in the market in, in 2022. We had a lot of the major currencies, such as the euro, uh, Chinese RMB, Japanese yen, all weakening in comparison to the US dollar. So when we actually look at the market in constant terms, if we remove the effects of currency, actually much more positive and almost 20% growth from the prior year. On the right-hand side of this table, what we're looking at is the weighted effects of the currency, uh, also volumes, and also pricing of agrochemicals as well, and how that influenced the market in 2022 on a regional basis. So, for example, you can see Asia-Pacific volumes were the key driver of growth in the region, coming from what I touched on, improved weather conditions in markets such as Australia. We had high pest pressure in countries such as India and China. Um, pricing, and if you look in the Americas, pricing is the key positive here. So what we mean by pricing is the, the very high levels of agrochemical pricing, particularly for products which are very important in the Americas, such as glyphosate and glyphosinate. So pricing a key driver in 2022. Now, what that means for 2023, uh, what we're looking at as we move through into this current year, is this is some of the sort of key global factors that will influence the market. So there is expectations for lower fertilizer prices, now, what this means typically is that if a farmer spends less on his fertilizers, then he has more left over to spend on other crop inputs, such as crop protection chemicals. So we tend to believe low fertilizer prices are a positive for crop protection. Uh, energy prices, while they're still high, uh, they are expected to come down from the peak levels that we've seen in 2022. Uh, so this is different. Uh, the energy is really across the board. So what we mean is farmers will have lower fuel costs, uh, energy costs to actually produce the agrochemicals will typically be lower, so therefore um, some pricing deflation. Commodity prices expected to remain strong in 2023, but still lower than the high pricing situation that we've seen in 2022. Um, so, as I mentioned, crop commodity prices are uh, very strongly tied to the performance of the crop protection market. If we start to see them coming down from where they were in 2022, then we'd expect this to be a negative for the market. We also have continuing weakness in the major currencies, so the dollar is continuing to strengthen against Chinese, Japanese, Euro and British currencies. Uh, so that is, when you look at it in, in constant terms, that's definitely a negative. As we've seen agrochemical pricing, we expect to start uh, stabilising and coming down, uh, so this will be a, a deflator to the market. Some of the unfavourable weather conditions that we had in the sort of latter part of 2022 or, or mid-season particularly in Central and Southern Europe, and also uh, Southern and, and Western USA, particularly California, experiencing very hot and dry conditions. Uh, if these alleviate in 2023, then we'd expect that to be a positive for the market. Now, there's a lot of information here, but I'll just touch on some of the sort of key factors behind this. So what we're looking at is our expectations for the 2023 market, but in terms of the key regional drivers. Now, if you look at North America, uh, very early indications indicate that the, the maize area could be up slightly, uh, but expectations are for the soybean area to actually decline. In Canada, wheat area up strongly, but canola down, which is reversing the trend we had in the prior year. Wheat is a very is, is a more uh, intensive crop use for crop protection in Canada, so we tend to see that as a positive. The high commodity prices again, but coming down from where they were in 2022. Um, Glyphosate and glyphosinate prices, again, expected to, to start coming down from the peak levels that we've seen towards the end of 2020, uh, 2021 and into 2022. For Central and South America, uh, Brazilian soybean and maize areas continuing to increase, so that's obviously a positive. Um, some of the negative factors here is some issues in Argentina, so the wheat area down quite considerably. We've also seen shortages of pesticide supply in Argentina. 
some growers are having issues uh, obtaining enough supplies for key products that they need through the growing season. This could affect uh, sales. We have seen pesticide imports in Brazil rising sharply due to fears over supply issues. There were concerns over inventory buildup, but we have had a lot of um, robust demand in, in this season that would alleviate that somewhat. Now, in Europe, there is also issues around inventory. What we're seeing in Europe is the very hot and dry conditions in 2022 led to a decline in uh, pest pressure in general. So a lot of the product that had been purchased in anticipation of a, a strong summer season were actually still being held on farm or in distribution as this product couldn't move through the channels because growers were applying less than what they expected to. So we're seeing some buildup of inventory in Europe. We're also seeing some buildup of inventory in North America as well. There was a lot of pre-buying in 2022 as growers were very concerned that um, they had the same issues of the prior year where supplies were uh, very short. They couldn't have enough product to last them for the entire season. So pre-buying in, in North America was robust. Uh, and coupled with the very dry, hot weather we've seen in a lot of the, the Southwest and even stretching into the Corn Belt as well, we've seen uh, these inventories start to build up. So we'd think these would be a negative as we move to 2023 in terms of companies having to or trying to sell these products into the channel that are already quite well stocked in terms of on-farm on supplies and in the distribution channel as well. Other issues in Europe that we're seeing, uh, obviously the Russia-Ukraine situation is continuing on, but we are seeing some alleviation in terms of trade from Ukraine due to Black Sea grain deals, etc. So there is some prospects that Ukraine could start exporting their crop produce again. And this is partly why we think commodity prices are going to start coming down. But it does allow uh, Ukraine to get back into the picture in terms of agriculture and crop protection as well. And Ukraine had been a rapidly developing market for crop protection products prior to sort of 2022. So we think it's a positive if Ukraine agriculture starts to kick back in again. Um, of course, there is still continuing issues here and we don't expect a diplomatic solution anytime soon, but uh, definitely more positive moving into 2023. Um, in Asia Pacific, as I mentioned, um, weather was very positive in 2022. We think again, um, quite positive in 2023 in general. Uh, we're seeing a lot of recovery from drought that we had in the sort of earlier 2020s, much more positive. India is starting to uh, increase the minimum support prices for a lot of crops, which obviously benefits uh, grower incomes and then subsequently uh, spending on crop inputs as well. And of course, Asia Pacific is a very strong glyphosate market, so that the high pricing, continuation of high pricing could be benefit the market here. But it's coming down from peak levels, but still very high by historical standards. Now, again, the importance of commodity prices to the crop protection market, what we're looking at here is tracking it back to the start of 2019. You can see the spikes that we had in 2022. So as I mentioned, very high levels and record levels for a lot of these different crop commodities that we've seen uh, during 2022 through a number of different situations. So Ukraine and Russia inability to export their products to the same destinations as they could the prior year. A lot of countries looking to hold on to their own crop produce and uh, fears of any domestic food security concerns that ar ar arose th uh, primarily through the pandemic. And also the unfavorable weather conditions that we've seen in the sort of summer in, in Europe and the US in particular. Um, but, and you can see futures prices here tracking below the levels that we've seen in 2022. But again, for most of these crops, uh, still high by historical standards. Now here, this really charts how strongly the, the correlation is between crop commodity pricing and crop protection market. So the blue bars here are the percentage change in the market from year on year. And the lines are showing the fluctuation in crop commodity prices. So there's a strong correlation between uh, increasing commodity prices and then uh, benefiting the volume of the, uh, the value of the market. Now, what we expect for 2023 is because these commodity prices are coming down, we're seeing agrochemical pricing coming down as well, um, and all the different factors that I touched on, build-up of inventory, for example. Uh, we do expect the market in 2023 to be a lot less um, positive than it was in 2022. So the pricing situation, the inventory situation, crop commodity pricing situation, all flattening out. 
um, and we're thinking for 2023 crop protection market around about a 2% difference from what we've seen in 2022. So much less uh, dynamic than what we've seen in the last few years, but coming much uh, more back to a sort of flattening out. Uh, whether that is a positive 2% or a negative 2%, that remains to be seen. As I mentioned, there is a lot of different factors that could change that, such as weather, such as how uh, fast this inventory could be pushed out, and also how uh, robust the agrochemical pricing or the commodity pricing situation will remain. So we think about plus or minus 2% into 2023, and again, that is coming from a very, very positive uh, 2022. Now, this slide is really just looking at the agrochemical pricing and, and why our reckoning is that that's going to continue to come down in 2023. You can see the very high peak levels that were achieved at the end of 2021 and into the start of 2022. But the trend is very clearly showing this is starting to come back down. So we had almost a perfect storm of different variables in 2021 that affected the, the pricing and supply situation of key active ingredients. These are listed here, so high freight, price, high freight costs, high uh, intermediate prices as well, and also China um, having issues around labour availability and its double control uh, power supply policy as well, which has started to, to lessen to a, a degree through 2022 as the policy has slightly changed uh, to be looking at a more regional level. So we expect the, the pricing situation to have a bit more flat in 2023, uh, which obviously is leading to less positive outlook for the market. And I mentioned price development of some of these key metrics that we look at in the crop protection industry and ag agriculture as a whole. And you can see, um, this is from World Bank, we expect fertilizer pricing to start to come down. As I mentioned, that could be a positive to crop protection because a farmer will have more of his income that will be able to be diverted to this. Of course, offset by any declines in commodity pricing. You can see grain pricing coming down from 2022, but still uh, very high compared to what we've seen in the last decade or so. Uh, same situation for oils and meals as well. So still positive by historical standards, but again, 2022 is, is a, a relative outlier. And energy costs, a lot of different issues around this, a lot of it related to uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation again, and also China as well. But you can see peaks in 2022 and then starts to come back down again. So it looks like uh, from all of our indications that all of these pricing that was peaking in 2022 starting to come back down again as we move through to 2023. Now, if we start to look further ahead in 2023 and we want to see how the crop protection market is going to perform over the next decade or so, or even further out, these are some of the key positive and negative factors that we would consider. So some of the key ones in terms of the positives for the market moving forward we're seeing increased technification in developing markets. And this is uh, coupled with a sort of base treated acreage growth in a lot of these countries. So we're seeing Southeast Asia, Central and South America, some of the smaller countries there, and also Eastern Europe, including the sort of more recent entrance to the EU. These are all countries that are growing rapidly and coming from a low, relatively low base and looking at increasing the product usage intensity and also increasing the technification of the products that they're using. So this comes with not only a value uplift, but also a volume uplift as well. We're seeing increased uptake of biologicals. Um, this is a key driver moving forward. Um, benefiting from a lot of consolidation in the industry and is becoming much more technified as well now, looking at improved formulation technologies, for example. We've just seen Corteva make a huge acquisition in this space, building from a, a prior acquisition earlier this year as well. So consolidation is accelerating and we expect this industry to continue to, to move forward uh, far in advance of the conventional chemical crop protection sector. We're also seeing strong market penetration of newly introduced products. Of course, these products that are newly introduced now are far from their peak sales potential. So as we move forward, these products are expected to grow in importance as we move forward. So this is products such as methane trifluconazole, which is a good fit in a lot of different uh, regions, but is finding good success right now in Europe for septoria control, which is a pest which has developed resistance to a lot of existing technologies. And we're also seeing new herbicide modes of action start to come into the market now as well. So it's a sort of first new modes of action for weed control for around about 30 years. So we're seeing a big shift uh, in herbicide usage as well, and this obviously is expected to benefit the market moving forward. 
where previously the GM technology had took, taken a lot of value or a lot of the growth potential out of the herbicides market. We're actually seeing resistance issues around glyphosate, et cetera, ALS products, AC case inhibitors now as well. We're seeing a, a lot of new uh, herbicide strategies having to come in, and this is pushing in the advancement of new modes of action as well. But some of the negatives as we move forward, we are expected to see new um, plant input trade acres in China, so they're going to adopt, for example, GM maize very soon. We're seeing regulation removing a lot of products from the market. This is sort of in conjunction with a lot of countries and regions looking at pesticide volume reduction targets as well. So regions such as the EU and countries such as China, Japan, Brazil, USA, etc., all looking to, over the next 15 to 20 years, significantly reduce the actual applied volumes of pesticides that are putting down in their fields. This, while it's, we've got it as a negative here, it, it does provide positive potential for some of the newer technologies that are applied at relatively lower volumes. So a lot of the older products would expect to start being pushed out of the market. But these could be replaced by uh, newer, more recent introductions that are efficacious at much less um, volumes. And I mentioned that weather is a key driver in agriculture in general, but also in crop protection specifically. And we're seeing now effects of climate change start to lead to more frequent and more severe climatic impacts. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're seeing now the third consecutive La Nina year, which could lead to dryness in Central and South America and a lot of regions, particularly uh, southern regions in Argentina, etc. Uh, but this is leading to more wet conditions in South Asia and Australia, for example. And this is now becoming more severe and more frequent, these different types of events that we're seeing now. Uh, so this is a big challenge for agriculture in general and crop protection moving forward. And we're seeing new GM seed technologies coming through as well that could impact the market, such as those incorporating RNAi technologies, such as those that can provide control of sucking pests in addition to the current chewing pest spectrum, and also new herbicide tolerance uh, varieties coming in, PPO and HPPD, for example. So in terms of quantification, what that really means for the market moving forward, this is pulled from a, a recent report that we did called the Future of Agriculture Report. And this is a, a broad looking report that's looking at a number of different factors, uh, agricultural, social, economic, uh, et cetera, all looking at um, different changes that are expected through agriculture in these years across all different regions. And then the subsequent impacts we expect that to have on the crop protection market. So you can see why we expect it to be positive moving through to 2035. There is a huge um, deflator coming out of the market, which is due to regulation. So the EU in particular has a very harsh regulatory viewpoint. There's a lot of products expected to expire over the next decade or so. This will uh, take all of that value out of the market. <clears throat> of course, this can, in some cases can be replaced by new products or technification where they're trading up to newer technologies, such as the lower volume ones that I touched on. But in terms of uh, negative regulation is the key uh, deflator of market moving forward. But you can see uh, new products, very positive, and a lot of that is coming from new biological products as well. So bio is included in this, and bio is the key driver between now and 2035 in taking the value of the crop protection market forward. In actual terms, we view the CAGR of uh, biological products up to 2035 to be in the double digits. So very strong rates of growth. However, for conventional chemical crop protection, once we take all of these factors into consideration, we're actually seeing that being very flat to slightly negative up to 2035, based on a number of, of different factors that we've touched on already. Um, so that's really looking 2023 and having a view towards 2035 for all of these different uh, factors. So I'll pass you over to Alistair now and he can discuss in more detail the sort of performance of the seed market. That's great. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, my part of the presentation, we're going to have a look at what happened in 2022, have a brief look at what the expectations are so far for the 2023 agricultural year, and then look a bit further out and um, see, have a look at, see some of the uh, technology drivers for future value evolution. So what we're looking at here is the 
planted area of, of the world and then also some of the key countries and key crops that are cultivated in the 2022 agricultural year. And when I talk about the agricultural year, that's um, the period going from summer to summer because you're capturing the, uh, the main planting times in both the northern and summer, southern hemispheres. So what were the, some of the key drivers for these area changes that we, are, that we saw in 2022? Firstly, there was the, the high input costs were um, a negative for, uh, for some seed, particularly uh, nitrogen heavy crops such as uh, maize or corn require high cost inputs. And that was actually a negative for cultivation. Also, the uh, domestic consumption or export opportunity of uh, the cultivation of these crops were, were drivers or um, the, the opposite. And then also the export tax situation, particularly for countries like Argentina, it's the it, Argentinian soybean. So what the key reason why Argentinian soybean declined 3% was because of these um, high, high export taxes. But you can see here, just looking at it at a crop standpoint, we've got uh, maize or corn declining 2.3% over the previous year, really driven by the major areas in the, the US, which declined, EU27 and China and India all declining. So all of these major areas dragging down the, um, the world total. In soybean, 3.1% up over the previous year, very strong production in 2022 across, uh, across the world, being driven by higher areas in the US, China, India, Bra and Brazil. It's interesting to note that India is uh, the largest soybean area outside of the Americas, and in fact, the, the fourth largest soybean area in the world. You don't typically think of India as being a major soybean producer. In cotton, we have a 0.3% increase over the previous year, largely driven by uh, the major areas in the US, Brazil, and India. We have China um, cotton area going down. That's because the Chinese cotton area is going through a period of transition at the moment through government mandate and um, through um, financial support, driving cultivation to be centered into the West of the country. And though while the, uh, the Western part of the country saw a larger cotton area, areas across the rest of China actually declined, pulling down the, um, the overall area. Moving into rapeseed and sunflower, we have a larger rapeseed area, despite Canada falling almost 4%. However, that was fully expected in Canada because the year before there was extreme weather that uh, impacted production. And it was expected that uh, in 2022 to meet the uh, level of production that was required, yields were actually going to facilitate that. So growers knew that they were going to have higher yielding crops that year. So they actually planted less, but they still produced the amount that they required. In sunflower, we see almost a 6% decline, but that is largely driven by what's been happening in Ukraine. And you can actually see that in response to the, that declining uh, area in Ukraine, uh, lots of other countries have actually increased their um, sunflower areas to make use of these high commodity prices. It's interesting to note that uh, Argentina increased its uh, area almost 18% over the previous year. If you went back 20 years, it would, Argentina would be one of the largest sunflower um, areas in the world, and in fact was the largest sunflower exporter before that title um, was transitioned over to the Ukraine. So when you're looking at this slide, if you assume a static seeding rate, as in the amount of seed that goes over a particular hectare, what you're actually looking at here is the volume change within the industry. And so when you actually translate that over to what's happened with seed prices and the impact of currency, what that's actually resulted in is a, uh, an approximate 6.8% increase in nominal US dollar terms over the previous year. But like I say, high input costs um, have been a negative, but that has been more than offset by the high commodity prices. And there is a very strong correlation between the trading prices of harvested crops and the actual seed price, because 
more money into a grower's pocket, which means um, companies offering inputs can price it higher. And we've seen higher input costs for everything uh, in agriculture, whether it be crop protection, seed, fuel, fertilizer, machinery, all input prices were up. So I'm not going to take any time um, going through all of these factors. I feel we've um, we've covered these enough already, and also you can read the slide at your leisure afterwards. So just moving into 2023, it is a little bit early in seed. I mean, the analysis of crop protection and uh, the seed industry are are quite different because there are different drivers between the the two industries, and really. The what we've seen in 2023 so far is that there has been a positive start in the South American season. We've seen across the region generally higher maize and soybean areas and uh, combine that with a strengthening uh, Brazilian real uh, is looking very positive for the start. Early, very, very early indicators show that the US growers are likely to plant more corn in 2023 and um, less soybean. That has a very strong impact on the value of the sector because when you're looking at a, a hectare standpoint, your average corn bag, well, your average hectare price of corn is in the $220 per hectare range where soybean is much, much lower than that. So when you're transitioning a planted area from soybean over to uh, corn, there is a, a much stronger um, positive influence. However, there are some negatives that uh, have the potential to impact the, the uh, traded seed market in 2023. We have falling crop prices. And even though they're still relatively strong compared to history, they will be lower than what 2022 is. And you can look at this through um, the futures prices. And even when applying an approximate grain traders margin to these um, futures, it is still likely that they will below will be below that was achieved in 2022. And like I say, there's a strong correlation between trading prices of harvested grains and oil seeds and what the seed price but also there what we've seen in the first quarter of the agricultural year which is equivalent to the third quarter of the calendar year is that we are seeing poor exchange rates into uh, US dollars um, so far there has only been one um, currency that has actually been positive and that is like I say is the Brazilian real but we've seen declines in uh, the Japanese yen, the pound sterling, the euro. The euro just in that quarter is about 15% um, decline. Indian rupee and the Chinese yuan as well. So all of these, we're looking at uh, quite a mixed bag between positives and negatives. And it would be quite interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out, especially when it comes to the planting times in North America. You know, we have this third third year of uh, weather events and it's it there is the strong potential that there will be delayed um, u.s planting as we have seen in uh, prior years and if that happens then then that can upset the uh the planting between maize and soybean and also prevent plant acreages may come into play as well so just looking further out to 2023 and concentrating on just the GM seed market. The reason why we're focusing on just the GM seed market here is that it is a technology driven market. And um, when you're when you're looking at a forecast in real terms, you're looking at product mix and volumes. And of course, we expect that there will be a further transition of planted areas from conventional non-GM areas over to GM technology. And so if we were to put conventional seed into this analysis, all it will show is a declining conventional seed market as volume is transitioned away from conventional to GM, hence why we're just focusing on this. But some of the key drivers for the expansion of the GM seed market um, out to 2030, we're looking at an average yearly increase in value terms of 3.4% from 2021 to 2030. 
Drivers of that will be that the um, GM corn area is likely to be much higher in 2023, given that the Chinese are looking to adopt GM technology in corn and soybeans in the next few years. We have greater areas in uh, the Philippines and Vietnam. They're both less than 20% utilization at the moment. We're expecting that to come up. We're going to have new technology introductions in the next 10 years. We have RNAi insect protection. RNAi is ribonuclease acid interference. It's a, um, a new way of um, giving insect resistance. It uses post-transcriptional gene silencing rather than the expression of delta endotoxins like you have in current BT technology. We have new varieties of short stature corn coming out on the market. We'll see in subsequent slides that there is non-GM versions coming out in the next few years that will soon to be replaced through biotechnology derived um, products. In soybean, we have further expansion um, of the soybean area in the Americas, predominantly in Brazil. Brazil is one of these few countries in the world that is just able to keep on expanding its arable um, area. And so combined new areas with new technology going down on that is going to result in, um, in lots of new value being put into the sector. In soybean, we're going to have new multiple mode of action herbicide tolerance is coming out and we'll see that in uh, the, the coming slides. And so just looking at technology, this is a mixture of both GM and non-GM technologies. It's GM unless it's actually stated in the comments. And so some of the new technologies that we're seeing coming out on the market is, like I say, is this new RNAi technology. RNAi was first deployed in uh, Bayer's VT Pro 4 product in South America in um, 2021. And that was deployed on approximately 200,000 hectares with the company expecting that to uh, ramp up thereafter. In 2023, we have uh, Corteva's Vorseed product coming out in North America, which is a combination of their existing chrome corn product with the RNAi bolted to it. We have um, Bayer's uh, VT4 Pro product coming out on the market the year after, which is their current Genuity Treceptor product bolted with RNAi. But some other interesting products that we have coming out over the next year. Um, I would like to highlight uh, Corteva's W3E1 cotton product. That's Wide Strike 3 in List 1. And what's really different about that product is that it lacks um, glyphosate tolerance in there. It's almost been a prerequisite for the last 15, 20 years that any um, GM cottonseed product being planted in the US will have glyphosate tolerance. However, because of the prevalence of glyphosate tolerant weeds in uh, US cotton crops, it's, Corteva has taken the decision to actually not use glyphosate tolerance uh, and instead use the herbicide glyphosate as a mechanism of burn down for that crop, but also to, to control volunteer W3E1 um, varieties uh, in the subsequent um, cultivation period. Then just finally on this slide, I'd like to bring to your attention what's happening in um, soybean. Right now, we have um, the enlist and extend, ex uh, and extend flex systems being cultivated in North America. However, these generally utilize two or three uh, modes of action for herbicide tolerance. What's likely to happen over the next 10 years or so is that we're looking to have four, five, six way stacks of herbicide tolerance, uh, culminating with um, buyers, buyers um, HPPD, 2,4-D, glyphosate, glufosinate, dicamba, and PPO tolerances all stacked within um, that product, giving the, uh, the, the grower the flexibility uh, to use uh, the, that particular AI at the correct time during its cultivation period. And then finally, I would like to bring to your attention, um, if you look down at the, the bottom part of the uh, upper table, is that BASF, um, announced that they would be bringing out a five-way herbicide tolerance stack in the 2040s.
And you may ask yourself, why is a company like BASF saying that they're going to be commercializing a new product in such a far away time frame? Well, that's because uh, BASF, uh, along with Syngenta, Bayer and Corteva, took part in AgBio Investor and Crop Life International's um, black box study for the cost and time it takes to develop a new GM trait. This is available to download from our um, free to access website, gm.agbioinvestor.com. Please uh, feel free to visit there and download your copy. But I'm happy to summarize the findings of that report. And that is that the time taken to bring a novel GM trait from discovery to the point of commercialization has actually increased from 13.1 years to 16.5 years. But conversely, the amount of dollars that it takes to facilitate that has fallen from 136 million to 115 million. And the reason for both of these, um, these data points is that the time taken for a product to actually go through the regulatory um, part has increased considerably during the time frame that was uh, being polled for this black box study. But Conversely, the amount of time being spent in early discovery phase has actually fallen. And this is as a result of high throughput testing and um, being much more selective on, uh, on those candidates. And so with that, I think we've actually been uh, pretty good with our time and uh, we, we've finished. So with that, I'd like to hand back to uh, Rini and um, she will be able to um, ask us some questions. Thank you, Alistair. And thank you, Derek. It was a great presentation. And we do have some questions um, from our audience. Um, I'm going to start with the first one, which was Asha Sharma. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, I'm going to go to the next one. Um, we are cognizant that certain diamide patents have expired for, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, Prynax, Pry insecticide in US. Is yeah. this context how you would characterize price trajectory? Um, well, first off, I don't know about the patents expiring in the US. I think that's that's some way off, but I know that the patents are under threat and coming off patent in, in certain other countries for that product. Um, obviously, the patent expiry generally comes with an increase in genetic competition and from that price erosion as well. So I think it's inevitable. It might not be short term, but definitely um, longer term. It's happened with every AI that has come off patent in general terms for most AIs, the price of the AI will start to decline as the genetic competition starts to increase. And of course, that's why it's important for all of these sort of companies with their own R&D programs to continue to develop new products. So there's always a proprietary element to their portfolio. So they're protected against genetic competition in a lot of cases. And of course, a key strategy for companies to protect their, their uh, proprietary element to their portfolio is to include mixtures with off-patent products together with the proprietary part as well. So they're protecting the off-patent product by combining it with a proprietary one that they can then offer to, to growers that is uh, advantageous to them and which obviously a generic competitor won't be able to offer as well. So yeah, the patent expiry of not just that product, but most AIs is um, that the price will start to come down once genetic competition starts to increase. Mm -hmm. Thank As I mentioned, you. that's for that product. It is, I think the the key impacts on price erosion are still some way out because FMC, who own that product, do have a lot of different supply agreements in place with a very big companies. So they have a very strong position in that product. They're very good at protecting the off patent lifespan of products that they have, which they've shown through uh, sulfentrazone is a good example. It's a product that came off patent, but FMC is still able to protect a lot of its market share through different strategies. So I think, yes, patent expiry will ultimately lead to price erosion, but I think that's more of a long-term impact for Renaxipire. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, where does biologicals fit into your crop protection forecast waterfall? Well, the, the biological, I'll go back to the slide, but um, the future of Agriport has it obviously split, split out in more detail. This is just a high level overview. Um, the biological part is um, included in the values, obviously, in the blue bar, so this includes bio and conventional. If we're looking at um, 
biologicals they're actually split through all of the different categories so they're not broken out for this chart so we have uh, obviously regulation is unlikely to impact biologicals over the next 20 years or so um, they have a very safe regulatory profile uh, technification is included in here so that's aspects that i was talking about in terms of not just product technification where we're looking at new formulations of biological products that are more efficacious and for example open field situations we're also including in technification is the technification of a market that is transitioning from older products to newer products and a lot of the time that includes bio as well but also resistance management bio products are very important and not just ipms but also in uh, diseases or other pests that have developed resistance to existing technologies so for example if you look out to 2035 we think the bioherbicides will become a much, much more important part of the uh, crop protection market. So the value of bioherbicides growth is rolled into all of these different categories and resistance management is quite an important one for bioherbicides. Also area growth. So area growth is not just actual crop area, but we're talking about treated areas as well. So as bio starts to be used in more and more areas, then we're looking at expansion there as well. And as I mentioned, if they start to be uh, more efficacious in open field situations, you'd obviously expect the potential area for bioproducts to increase exponentially. And new products as well. So we have a continual stream of new biological products coming into development. And as I mentioned, sort of m and activity and consolidation has really been ramping up in this sector. So what we're getting from that is where before a product was only available through certain distribution channels or in, in certain niche markets, the consolidation and m and that's going to accelerate is expected to increase the availability of these products as bigger companies start to take more involvement in the sector through m and So the answer really is that bio is, is rolled into all of these different sectors. We do have a split out separately in this report, but for the purposes of this presentation, uh, bio has split into all of this, but it is the key uh, growth driver up to 2035. As I mentioned, the CAGR for bio at this period is actually double digit, but for conventional chemical, it's actually very, very flat over the period. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question is, where do you see hybrid wheat markets developing and percent of market and what percent of market will it displace over typical open pollinated varieties through 2025 to 2030 and 2030 to 2035? Um, yeah, okay. The, I mean, the hybrid wheat market is still a very, very developing market, probably going to be focused on the European and Canadian markets, large wheat areas. Um, it's likely to be something that is going to be driven by commodity price, because uh, growers actually have to see that financial incentive before they actually pay for a higher priced seed. Because, um, you know, Ag Buyer Investor, we're actually based in what we would class as Scotland's grain belt. Uh, there's a lot of cereal cultivation going on around us, of which wheat is one of them. And if you speak to farmers around here and ask them what they pay for their seed, they go, oh, no, sorry, we don't pay for our seed, we save our seed. So, you know, there has to be that development of um, the seed. Is it going to be more vigorous? Is it going to have uh, have um, more agronomic traits in there? Is there going to have higher disease resistance or, or so forth, greater standability um, to prevent lodging and so forth? So I would say that the adoption of hybrid wheat is likely to be dictated what the, the trading prices of harvested grains will be in, uh, in the coming future. But there is that general trend within the seed industry of always moving towards a higher percentage of uh, hybrid utilization. It's been seen in other cereals, such as uh, hybrid rye within the EU. The EU area for hybrid rye has been increasing generally year on year in the likes of KW. US and uh, Vilmoran do do comment on um, on such developments. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Um, next question. Uh, they said thanks for a great presentation. Um, do you have any comments about the future of dicamba in Brazil? Um, I, I think it says hectares are expected to increase considerably. Um, I mean, for dicamba in Brazil. Um, Obviously, it's a product that doesn't have a strong history in the country, so it's not very widely used by growers in Brazil. And of course, as 
um, growers look to mitigate against the effects of glyphosate resistance that we've been seeing increasingly in countries like Brazil, then start to look at alternatives. And then, of course, uh, if you have the um, Extend technology, then you have dicamba tolerance that you can then apply dicamba to your crop. But I think um, what my understanding is in Brazil, there's a bit of, uh, because they don't have the history of dicamba use that the US had, and the US is now having these regulatory issues around dicamba with Extend, for example. Um, and there's been a lot of cases that have involved uh, potential crop damage to neighbouring fields, etc. What we've seen is there's a bit of a reticence in Brazilian growers um, to start using this on a, on a wide base because of the regulatory concerns in the US and the potential impacts that it has on not their crop, but on, for example, neighbouring crops or other different crops within their own system. Um, so I think that there is regulatory concerns around the use of dicamba in Brazil because they don't have the history of it and they're coming from basically no use of dicamba to what would be uh, expanded in a number of acres. I think that's maybe a more longer term and it would be probably driven more by buyer than by the growers. But I think we have to uh, wait and see on dicamba uptake in Brazil because it's my understanding that uh, grower awareness or grower um acceptance of that is, is a bit off at the moment mm -hmm. okay thank you uh this is a question from Jean Zanazzo. Um, brazil is one of the biggest markets what is your view for the political situation there impacting cur currency and overall business yeah i think it's 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 still quite early to to tell at the moment but i think it, it could have implications for um, the crop protection industry in general and also seeds as well because I think the previous uh, regime was quite keen on or very um, reluctant to stop any sort of deforestation or increase of arable land and I think what we're seeing from the, the, the new government is more of a focus on environmental policies and uh, stopping the sort of deforestation or at least not expanding it as fast as what had been previously. So I think the, the biggest implications or potential uh, changes that we would see would be a slowdown in the increase of available arable land in Brazil. If you've been in the situation Alistair mentioned it, is that arable lands in Brazil continuing to expand, but of course that's coming at the expense of other land. So what you would have before is deforestation, change to pasture land, this pasture land then change to use for arable crops. Uh, if you start to stop the deforestation, then you don't have the same ability to expand, and then you could start to see more of the, the switch that we see in the US between maize and soybean, for example. You could start to see that coming in Brazil and more of a sort of switching case rather than just increasing the, the land that they have available. I think that's the biggest sort of implication of the, the new government in Brazil. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just to just to comment before we we take uh we're going to take a couple more questions and it looks like there's 17 questions so what we're going to do is take some of those questions and post them online and Alistair and Derek will answer those questions if you visit agribusinessglobal.com you'll also be able to download this presentation um at agribusinessglobal.com live we'll have the presentation and also you can watch the video again so i just wanted to say that before we take the next question um can you comment on BT resistant insects and the trend for that and where and what is or will be the responses by seed companies? Well, um, yeah, yes, there is, there is always going to be uh, the emergence of insect resistance. Um, to, to current BT technology. It's one of the reasons why uh, companies have entered into interlicensing agreements with each, within, with each other over the last uh, two decades. Even Monsanto in its heyday never had all of the technology in-house required to lower its refuge requirements. In the US, uh, the corn area, a certain air, certain percentage of the area has to contain non-BT traits and uh, to maintain a susceptible population of your target pests. And so where there has been some resistance build up to the technology is in technologies where only one or two genes have been pre present. However, what we have seen um, over the last decade or so is that 
seed companies have been utilizing more and more modes of action for the control of those specific pests to try and reduce the onset of resistance to that technology. And one of the successes of that is that you have seen the, the, the reduction in the level of um, structured refuge that these growers have been required to plant. I mean, it used to be that 20% of your planted area used to be just for refuge. But through the pyramiding up of these technologies, we saw that fall to 10% with um, DuPont's um, Optimum Acomax 1. Then it went down to 5% for smart stacks. And then you've now got uh, refuge in the bag technology. And so I'm sure it's something that the regulators are keeping a keen eye on. Um, that there will always be a need for refuge area because that is your safety net for the technology, always maintaining these BT susceptible pests. However, moving down into South America, for the likes of um, the intacta soybean that has only had one gene for the control of um, soybean lepidoptera, there has reportedly been that um, increase in resistance buildup. However, that is likely to be um, managed through uh, the um, intacta to extend coming out and, and also conquesta E3, which have multiple modes of action for the control of these pests. But also, you know, you have the emerging technology of RNAi as well, completely new mode of action for the control of insect pests. Although RNAi right now is only con uh, confined to corn rootworm only, below ground coleoptera. And so it is likely that in the future we will see RNAi technology branch out to control new insect spectrums. I mean, there are, in the last few years, we did see um, Mons Bayer Monsanto's Ligus um, controlling product come out. And that is the first time where we've had a genetic in-seed control of a sucking pest rather than a biting pest. So uh, it would be in the next 10 to 20 years, I, I would think that we will see new higher performing GM traits that come out, which will help manage the uh, resistance buildup. But GM traits are not a one-stop shop silver bullet for the control of these insect pests. They are part of an overall insect protection management program. Um, the use of BT technology does not completely eliminate the need for insecticide sprays they maybe reduce the amount of insecticidal sprays required. So it's part and parcel with the, uh, the current technology. Great, thank you, Alistair. Uh, this will be our last question. And again, we'll, I've copied all the questions that have been posted and we will have Alistair and Derek answer those questions and then post them on a blog. So please visit agribusinessglobal.com to get those answers. All right, last question. Um, in your forecast on crop protection in 2035, how much of the traditional uh, Crop protection do you see being eroded by biologicals? You seem to have only declines in market growth from regulation, uh, not bio-replacement. Yeah, so uh, we don't think that biologicals are effectively a direct replacement or a value uh, deflator of conventional. The key deflators for conventional are regulation. Um, we're not really seeing, um, but bio is coming in as an addition or a complement to conventional chemicals. Um, it's not at this stage or to 2035. Regulation is taking the conventional chemicals out. And in some cases, these can be replaced by bio, but it's not a case that a bio product is coming in and pushing out the conventional uh, that can provide the same control. So really what we're seeing is bio is being complementary to conventional. What, what we actually expect to see is, is a big increase in the number of different hybrid products that we have. So we have, there's a few hybrids on the market now which are conventional with bio. We think this will increase as we go through to 2035. There'll be a big spectrum of different hybrid products. Um, but I would say that bio is more complementary to conventional than replacement. Of course, in places like the EU where they're looking to reduce conventional pesticide use, in some cases this can be, uh, bio would come in. But it's not a case of the bio is coming in and pushing the conventional out. The conventional is being pushed out by regulation and the bio can come in uh, where possible to replace that use. So I think it's more complementary than replacement, but definitely bio is the biggest growth driver. If you split conventional from bio, bio is by far the biggest growth driver to 2035. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Derek and Alistair. Uh, Derek and Alistair also have um, created an article for us for Agribusiness Global Direct's January issue. It's a complimentary article to this presentation. So please subscribe if you haven't already so you'll be able to get that information. Um, this concludes our webinar. Um, thank you again, both for the wonderful presentation. And um, again, this will be posted on agribusinessglobal.com to review. All right, thank thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.